All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Good evening or good morning or good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Um, thank you for, for joining us for this session. Um, I'm Heidi Stiller with NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. Uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity uh, to moderate this expert panel today and to engage with all of you uh, who are tuning in. Uh, this session, as you know from the title, is really all about putting people before property. Uh, reframing the conversation, the planning, the policies, and the implementation of relocation and resettlement to prioritize human well being. To date, a focus on property has largely framed and driven our policies and approaches. And we see this reflected in everything from the risk modeling to cost benefit analyses, processes used in federal funding. Today's discussion is about how we might put people first. What would that look like for different disciplines? And how do we make the shift? Uh, I will note that over the course of this week's conference, I have heard a lot of people talking about this very thing, the people side of it all, which has been really heartening. Um, and I'm excited for this session to leverage what we've all been learning over the course of the week. In just a few minutes, our panelists will introduce themselves, uh, but they bring expertise in climate change impacts to people and communities as well as to ecosystems and infrastructure. They also bring expertise in the processes and policies surrounding societal responses to climate change impacts, including energy policies. And they also have expertise in how law, funding and financing, and insurance are all part of the puzzle. Uh, and we have to get, give a special thanks today uh, to one of our panelists, Michael Wara, for jumping in at the last minute. Uh, he offered to take Carolyn's place today because she is under the weather. As we get going, um, I do want to just say a bit about the perspective that I'll be bringing um, to the conversation today. In my job with NOAA, um, I work to make science accessible and actionable. A lot of my work is with communities in the Gulf of Mexico region, which means that resilience and adaptation are front and center in my job. Uh, and the people side of resilience is something that has been really brought home for me throughout the course of my career. I remember my first job after grad school I was with the North Carolina Division of Emergency Management. And that's when I learned that post-disaster funding doesn't make people whole. The people who need it get the least assistance. And then in 2005, people that I loved and cared about were rescued from their roof after Katrina, and they were unable to contact relatives for three days. It was ultimately a journalist reporting from their shelter who offered to make the call for them. And then just a couple years ago, this is something that, that really has stuck with me. A teacher in South Louisiana invited me into her seventh grade classroom. And we asked the kids how many of them had experienced flooding in their home. Almost every hand in the room went up. And then later that day, the, the teacher was in tears and she was talking to me about how she doesn't know if she should tell her kids to stay and try to enrich their community or if she should tell them to leave. Uh, to move for their own safety and well-being. So these human dimensions have, have really hit home for me, um, and I'll be bringing that to the conversation today. And I, I know we'll hear examples of how people haven't been put first in the past, but I'm also really excited to talk about how they could be first. We really do want this session to be participatory, and to that end, I'm going to ask everyone, if you would, please introduce yourself in the chat um, if you just share your, your name and affiliation and, and anything else you might care to share, that would be great. So we know who's, who's out there today. Um, and then as we go along, please put your questions, reactions, comments into the chat as we go. Uh, our panelists are going to kick us off by addressing a couple of opening questions, but then we really want to have dialogue. Um, and I might pull out questions from the chat or even call on people to come off of mute and, and ask a question. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn to our panel and ask each of our panelists to take a few minutes to first introduce themselves and then to answer our kickoff question. And that question is, in your field, how have retreat and adaptation been focused on property more than people? And how might it look different if people were the focus? And we'll start it off with Catherine. Great, thank you so much, Heidi, and really appreciate people tuning in during dinner time if you're on the East Coast, and you know, really, really miserable time if you're in Europe. Hopefully, that'll be everyone watching later. 
Um, I'm based at the University of Miami. I focus on climate change risk and adaptation. I do a lot of decision and policy analysis, bringing together really different lines of evidence. Um, and I think a lot about the processes in which science is relevant or not, and what makes knowledge useful or not to these ongoing decisions. So I'll kick off my brief reflection here really in the spirit of the conversation that we'll be having today by probably posing more, more questions than I have answers. And we'll be working towards the theme of retreat, but from all of these complementary angles of law and economics and policy. But something that we've increasingly been considering is that avoidance of development in hazardous places is really intimately linked to the need to potentially retreat or handle risk in some other way after the fact. And when it comes to avoiding development in hazardous places, what we really know is that we're not good at it, right? We build faster in areas that are at risk of flooding than those that aren't. We build faster in areas of at risk of fire than those that aren't. And in my mind, it's still kind of a question how to think about this complex confluence of factors that is leading us to that place where clearly people like to buy property or rent, uh, where you've got the view of the water, uh, where you've got the view of those hills, even if they're at risk of fire. Um, but there's still, even at the stage of building in the first place, right, is such a big emphasis on property and markets and developers who don't necessarily need to worry about the full life cycle of risk once that property goes in. The tax base, which we've been thinking about so much over the course of this week. And I think when we think about people in these initial choices of siting, where we put infrastructure, where we put houses, oftentimes it's those living in the houses, right, who are dealing with it after the fact and these mismatches of incentives across the level of government that really come into focus. I think in the space of retreat, in a way, we've hit it all this week, so I'll keep this very brief, but as we've been talking about, you know, how do we choose which measure to manage risk through, whether it's putting in a seawall or elevating an infrastructure, I think as we've heard again and again and again, oftentimes property is really at the center of the tools used to inform our decisions. Um, processes often disproportionately favor those with power and voice, and often that wealth is manifesting through markets and the property themselves. You know, even when you think about who has access to the flood modeling that Heidi emphasized is really favoring property, you know, whether it's Army Corps or, you know, XP Swim or the highest resolution flood models, usually the average Joe really can't get access to those in a ready way to really query what if scenarios uh, for different options moving forward. So I think uh, the last thing that I'll just close with is as you think about moving towards people, what I would put forward is that we've been talking a lot over the last few days about the need to get out of this just being a bad set of options in a disaster circumstance and emergency, really recognizing that to favor people, we've got to have a much longer term view that's proactive in caring for the full set of priorities that are adopted. I think also when we think about how retreat or any other mechanism happens to have a people-centered approach, we may be taking very different options. And I suspect we'll have some interesting contrasts for floods versus fires. Um, and then so much of the coordination is about people in the end, uh, the full set of priorities that are relevant to these decisions, culture, equity, jobs, livelihoods, and so many things that go far beyond property and its value. So I'll close there. Heidi, back to you. Uh oh, Heidi may be in a thunderstorm right now. Let's see, I'll pass to Miyuki. <laughs> yeah, Heidi seems frozen, so we may be getting her back in a second here. Um, I'll just go for it. Um, and I'm at the hour of the day where the sun is starting to glare on my computer. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us and, and sticking in there on this Thursday evening. Uh, I'm Miyuki Hino. I'm an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill uh, in the Department of City and Regional Planning. So I'll be talking a little bit about um, this from a this challenge from a planning standpoint, but also just I think from the way that climate risk management and adaptation overall has been uh, thinking about land use. I think when you step back, you see the emphasis on property and property values carry through lots of different uh, realms here, not just um, the way that governments make decisions, but also the way the media portrays things and the research outputs that, that we create, right? We talk about 
asset value at risk from one meter of sea level rise, we measure hurricane damage in terms of dollars of, of structural losses usually. And then afterwards, we count the number of houses that we elevated with uh, some amount of government money. Um, we count the number of properties that were bought out in, in different places. And so, um, as Catherine said, it's problematic for lots of reasons. Um, it changes what options are on the table for different communities. It creates clear biases in lots of these decision-making processes. So I think there are lots of ways that re-centering this discussion would change, um, change lots of our conversations and, and research in lots of different fields. I'll just point out two um, ways in which I think it would actually change my own work. Um, I think first is that, you know, we would start evaluating flood risk management and climate risk management efforts based on how they affect people, not how they affect property, right? So uh, the point of elevating a house is not actually elevating the house, right? It's to contribute to people's well-being, their feeling of safety, and reducing the disruption from when events occur. But we don't capture those things. We just capture the number of structures that were elevated, not the people and how their lives were affected. So I think evaluating how these mitigation investments are actually affecting well-being in terms of physical mental health, um, access to education, access to economic opportunities, that would be right one of the first steps. And I think that would also then center renters much more in this conversation than it does right now, because um, the property focus immediately skews all of our attention towards people who own property instead of people who are affected by um, changes to, to structures. I think this shift is, is not like a crazy thing to ask for, right? FEMA does spend money on, on loss avoidance studies. They do go in and do evaluations of of some of their investments. And so um, this is a, a thing that would fit into that type of an evaluation program. Um, I think one of the other changes that um, this focus on, on people would bring is that you know, when we make future plans, and this is very true for planners, right? We think about the physical space, we think about zoning. Um, are we down zoning an area? Are we increasing de density in an area? Um, where is the floodplain going to move to um, in future decades, right? But we think much less about who is going to be in those places over time and how that might change due to forces that we know already push marginalized people into the more dangerous places. Um, and so when we think about these plans for the future and which places are growing, we're not really very often distinguishing between places that are growing because uh, the wildland urban interface might be where affordable housing exists, right? And that's why these places are growing because it's people trying to find places they can afford to live versus what's happening in, in places along the coast where it's you know people who are, are relatively well off, retiring and wanna live near the water and that's why an area is growing. Um, and so we think about these development pressures because they're going to change the physical environment, but we think less about the characteristics of the people that are creating those development pressures and how that would affect our decision making in the future. So I think those are two main ways where I think uh, my own work and, and the work of lots of my colleagues would shift if we were really to take more of a focus on people rather than the physical spaces and the property. Um, that has really dominated so much of our work so far. Um, and I don't know if Heidi is back. Is Heidi back? I am. Thanks, Miyuki. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if my video will come through. We had a, a lightning bolt take out the power here at my house. So um, I'm on a MiFi, so I, I hope to stay with you. Um, I think Michael is up next. Thank you, Heidi. Um, I'm, I'm Mike Wara. I direct the Climate and Energy Policy Program at Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, where I'm also a senior research scholar. And I work, um, I also say I also serve on the California Catastrophe Response Council, which is basically the oversight board for the wild, the utility wildfire insurance fund in California, and was once a wildfire commissioner in California. And so work with state government 
on issues related to uh, catastrophic wildfire um, in California and in other Western states. Um, I think that, well, one thing I, I should just say is for me personally, um, the, the Tubbs fire is about, was about 20 miles from my house. And as a wildfire commissioner, I've spent many hours speaking with and, and hearing testimony from the victims of the wildfires that have been such a, a plague um, upon California um, over the past five years or so. And um, I think when you spend time with disaster victims, it's really hard to avoid uh, engaging both emotionally and also rationally with the, the, the sort of people-centered aspects of this problem. And the challenge for wildfire, I think, is that for a very long time, um, wildfire has been managed by uh, natural resource agencies uh, like the U.S. Forest Service or the or um, the California Department of Forestry, which is now called Cal Fire, in terms of managing resources, right, Man protecting standing board feet of timber that might be harvested at some point in the future. Um, perhaps protecting the habitat of listed species um, that are that have been listed under the Endangered Species Act. And it's really only in the last few years, maybe the last 15 years, that the orientation around um, wildfire and wildland fire management has really started to shift toward greater thinking about community protection. And that shift has really been brought about as the losses have accumulated. And, and I think there's a, it's, it's, it's not a unanimous thing, but most people, it's certainly, certainly most people that spend their lives fighting fire, um, fighting wildland fire would, would, would agree with the statement that the wildfire environment we're in today is really different than it was when they started their careers, whether that start was five or 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. And that that's really been driven by um, you know the impacts of climate change, interacting with human decision making around fire exclusion in U.S. forests, um, where we we a hundred years ago basically, well, actually, I'd say one hundred fifty years ago, we um, forcibly removed Native Americans who actively burned the landscape, and then after 1910, made a policy decision at the federal level to try to put fires out whenever we could. And the combination of those two things has really made, kind of primed uh, the situation, made it much more explosive. And uh, climate change is only making that um, much worse. How we shift our thinking to, to a more people-centered focus, I think begins with those agencies um, that, that have control over the federal estate in the Western United States, which is a, you know, in, in California, I know the numbers better. The federal government owns 57% of the forest in California. Um, private entities own another 40% or so, and the state owns a very small percentage. So addressing the challenges of wildfire really do involve, you know, engaging with the federal landowners and with private landowners and changing our relationship to fire. And, and part of that is recognizing that that means changing our relationship to nature, that excluding people from nature is actually not natural, that, that people were in the landscape actively burning it long before European contact, and that the best solutions to wildfire, the best outcomes, the best fire outcomes really involve putting fire back on the landscape in a way that mimics um, the natural uh, fire ecology that existed 150 years ago. But in addition, making people the center of thinking about wildfire involves two other things. One is shifting our investments away from protecting board fee and towards protecting communities and really thinking constructively about how to invest in the natural infrastructure that's going to protect communities. You know, doing fuels management, hazardous fuels management around every community that's at risk. Um, 
it also, and, and this is, I think, a, a little bit different than, than for flood, involves thinking about the secondary impacts of wildfire in a much more robust way. Um, research I've done with uh, Marshall Burke and colleagues at Stanford has shown that um, probably on the order of thousands of people die each year from the smoke impacts of wildfire in the Western United States, that it's becoming one of the most, if not the most pressing air pollution concern in the Western United States. And seniors and children and pregnant women are probably the most vulnerable to the impacts. And being people-centered means thinking about the kids in the San Joaquin Valley that have to go to school with asthma, you know, with inhalers in their backpacks because they already have asthma because of chronically poor air quality and then are subject to acute asthma attacks when there's a wildfire in the Sierra and smoke, drift smoke covers the San Joaquin Valley and raises the AQI to 250. Um, so it's thinking more holistically about the problem and thinking about, thinking about the problem from a, uh, a very much a, um, a, a human-centered focus as opposed to a natural system focus, which has been historically where, understandably, where the, the land managers have, have, have been. Um, so I guess I will pass the baton to uh, Thomas at this point. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. That's very interesting to learn more about wildfire. And it's always interesting to hear those comparisons between wildfire and flood. Well, my name is Thomas Rupert. I'm an attorney and the coastal planning specialist for Florida Sea Grant and have been working on coastal planning and coastal hazards with a real focus on sea level rise for over 10 years now. So in my field of law, it's really hard to focus sometimes on people rather than property because it has really been all about property. And in fact, I've actually helped promote that for many years here in Florida because beginning about 10 years ago with the political situation in Florida at that point, there was no discussion of climate change or sea level or at the state level, there was no willingness to discuss sea level rise or climate change, only it's in a few local governments. And so I realized at that point that it was a real great entree into local governments not to go in talking about sea level rise, but to start talking about their infrastructure and impacts they were seeing. So it really worked well to say, look, here's your infrastructure. These are the impacts you're already seeing. Now I can introduce the topic of sea level rise and get them thinking about what is the future hold for your legal and financial liabilities potentially as sea levels continue to arise. So it was a great focus. But now, really, we're at a point where we should be starting to broaden and change that conversation. And yet I still feel like we are often, too often, stuck really just talking about infrastructure and engineering questions. And I think a lot of that just deals with, goes back to the fact that as difficult as the engineering can be, it really is a lot easier than dealing with these messy people problems that we really want to talk about. And there's been this theme running through this conference of the unique complexities in different situations and how every situation is very different. Well, law doesn't always like that. We like things, you know, we like to get rules that apply across the board. And I think the other thing with that's keeping us kind of stuck in the engineering really is that I think, I think we find a lot of comfort in focusing on the quote unquote hard science of engineering because it seems like we get reassured somehow thinking that, well, if we're doing hard science, it's giving us objective answers, right? But it really, that's completely false. There are no objective answers. Even when we're doing the science, what we're really doing is we're actually doing the science and the engineering analysis based on our own values. It's just, we're not necessarily making them explicit. And too often those values have really just been focused on property. Um, I mean, just think about an infrastructure. When we make decisions about where to put it, how much to spend, how to design it, there are values judgments implicit there. And so we really need to start to bring those out. And I mean, clearly science can, is key to help us better understand how to reach the goals that we really have based on our values, but let's try to make those a little more explicit. Um, 
and I think just as science can be used to pretend, to sometimes pretend that decisions about adaptation are somehow objective or neutral, the same can happen with what we call quote unquote property rights. Um, if you just say the phrase, suddenly everything based on that is going to be correct and somehow objective, right? Well, no, I would disagree. Property is very much a social construct. And I always like to talk with people about, the, about a great phrase from a early 1900s property theorist by the name of Wesley Hofeld. And to paraphrase, and he said, property is not a thing. Property is a set of relationships amongst people with regards to things. And so that really helps us understand very differently this idea of, of property, I think, because we need to deepen our understanding because right now we are really just kind of at the beginning of a really great, uh, really massive debate about who pays these costs and how and why. Um, there are just fun, and these are really fundamental normative questions that we need to address. So, you know, is it fair that private property owners lose their property to sea level rise? Does it matter who they are? Does it matter how long they've lived there? If, the, if it's not fair and somebody has to do something about it, who does something about it? Who pays for that? Who assists them? Um, just so many questions. And again, these are normative questions. They're not objective questions. And a lot of the answers, how we come up with those answers depend on how we define property. And I think before irretrievably committing massive resources, it would behoove us as people to really center people in that. And I think coming back to that definition of property that talks about, the, about property as the social construct that we have made um, about our relationships with regards to things, I think that can help us center people a little bit more. But my fear is really that we're pretty ill-equipped to do that, to have that real good conversation today. And I think in large part, it's because we really lack sufficient historical perspective, um, understanding of the nature of property as a social construct, even a vocabulary and intellectual framework to have a really robust discussion about property. I've said in other forums that it's almost like we've been fed this fast food diet about what property is, and it's left us full, but really undernourished. And what we really need to do is get back to a much more nourishing vision or learning of the complexity and the history of what property is. It's absolutely a fascinating history to think about because you can often look back through the lens of history. You can look back at history through different lenses, and when you put in the lens of property law, it's absolutely fascinating because you can start to see struggles between those with property trying to define it as more and those without defining it as less, the, cha the dramatic changes that have occurred in property. But yet today, the kind of common conception that's peddled very often to the public is that property is somehow, you know, kind of like the Ten Commandments came down from, from the mount and has always been etched in stone and is this ever this ever-present unchanging entity and nothing historically and legally could be further from the truth. So I think that you know if we can get to the point where we're really thinking again and kind of regain a vibrant public dialogue about what is property, I think that could help us in the law try to start centering people a little more in this discussion. Thanks, Thomas, and, and thanks all of you. Uh, really interesting reflections, and I'm, I'm struck how each of you spoke to a way we need to think differently, whether it's thinking about why do people move to risky places or thinking about our relationship to nature differently, or as Thomas just spoke to, thinking about you know what's, what's our social construct of, of property. Um, so this concept of thinking differently, I, I think, is a, is a thread. Um, so we have a, a second question that we want to ask each of our panelists. And I also want to pose this question to everyone who's online this evening. Um, and we'll ask you to put in the chat your thoughts about this question. Um, I will ask you to try and be brief in the chat just, just so we can read them all. No essays, please. Um, but we're going to ask each of our panelists to weigh in about what do they see as the most promising uh, development um, or direction in your field, and also what's what's the most problematic. So something that that's really encouraging, and also something that that you're worried about. 
Um, and for those of you online, if, if you would chat responses to, to either or both of those, that, that would be really great um, and helpful. So again, I will start with Catherine. Perfect, and I will uh, pick up with themes from Yuki, Michael, um, and Thomas. And actually, I see Susie Moser's um, comment here in the chat is uh, absolutely where I was thinking of going as well. Who's the we in this picture? Um, you know, so I think Michael um, really summed it up well. Of you know, the challenge of adaptation, the challenge of retreat is the degree to which it involves changing our relationship with fire, with flood, just uh, with the environment broadly speaking. I think the way Thomas emphasized that this is ultimately about the relationships people have with places, with properties, right? Not some value of property that exists in a vacuum. And ultimately it's the relationships they have with one another. Um, so I think what's promising for me is actually still in, or maybe it will always be in this very messy stage that Thomas described, but it's really the degree to which we are seeing adaptive pathways emerge action um, with some of the, the tensions really highlighted in the, the for whom, by whom. But you know, the context I know best are California and Southeast Florida, and I'll be leaving California to Mike, um, but really thinking about Southeast Florida, okay, what is that messiness that's actually really promising? Um, so first, I think it's the degree to which climate change is becoming part of the fabric of everyday life. And once that happens, you know, this theme of people versus places, uh, the narratives that exist, the stories that exist that really guide how people see the issue and what they're prioritizing exist in people and are all about people, right? So you have on the one hand, uh, the narrative of growth that um, is even written in state law in terms of uh, constraints put on local governments. Um, how, how do we grapple with that story of growth um, that's been the foundation of the region, um, but one where there's some real questions as to how you maintain that or do you maintain that um, under increasing climate change. And then I think kind of picking up this question of we, for whom, who takes the lead, I almost see sometimes the, the intense emergence of the so-called climate gentrification narrative is such a reaction against that in a really important way, recognizing that when you say, um, we're designing public, <clears throat> public policy at a local government level for the median household, recognition that very few people are at the median and what it actually means to experience climate change in a region with high sea level rise, um, big challenges with extreme heat, especially if you don't have reliable access to AC, is not so much about what's happening at that median household, but the degree to which uh, the wealthiest properties um, in effect end up driving a lot of decision making and the lowest income households um, that have been underserved uh, for many decades and into the present day bear the consequences of that, which also include displacement um, with weak renter laws. So I think this messiness for me is very much the degree to which the stories of climate change are now creating this human infrastructure, this narrative infrastructure that in some ways shapes all of the options moving forward. And from out of that, you see community organizations pushing so hard for change um, and slowly in this very interactive way, you know, we're, we're looking at strategies for how you grapple with sea level rise or how you grapple with extreme heat or all of these things coming together, including under a stressor of a pandemic and really recognizing that um, looking at the long term and evaluating as well as we can what's happening in real time is absolutely crucial for making progress. But I think the flip side of Heidi's question, you know, what's most problematic? Um, also is the degree to which climate change is surprising us, you know, whether it's been um, the beastly storm seasons in the Gulf, um, the, the ferocious wildfire seasons in the West. Um, you know, is it the case that we have scientifically underpredicted the se severity of events because we've looked at silos of a sector we can an analyze or one part of the climate we can analyze? You know, have we underpredicted this because it's the cascades that really get us the secondary impacts that Mike described of it's not just those at direct risk of fire, but those bearing the impacts of smoke that's increasingly um, reversing progress towards improved air quality. So I think really moving forward with an inclusive focus also really has to grapple with the fact that when we're under stress, when we're in circumstances of emergency, that's where we have often least held on to the priorities of equity and the full distribution of impacts and who is not just at the median or at the, the high end of the spectrum, but really disproportionately bearing impacts that affect that full scope of well-being that Miyuki described. Thanks, Catherine, appreciate it. Miyuki. 
Sure. Um, so I will. Uh, I will also start on my my more promising, more positive note. I think, um, and this is really. I've I feel more um, optimistic about this after the last couple of days being in this conference. I think there's an increasing recognition broadly, both um, within the research community and the practitioner community, and hopefully um, amongst people who are really experiencing climate impacts already, um, that there are positive outcomes that are possible through a process of moving, um, and that there are always trade-offs and that there are um, numerous and many horrific examples of people moving, um, but there can be uh, less negative ones and there can be things that can be gained through this process. Um, one analog that I often return to, um, because sometimes it's hard, right? You, I think we uh, are surrounded by narratives that are, um, very, like they often don't yield what we want, right? We often see um, oppressive structures that remain in place and uh, community-led efforts that are um, diverted due to, you know, people in power who are making different decisions. Um, so it's hard, I think, to hold on to that idea that there are potentially positive things that could happen. Um, so the analog I, I come back to often is the Moving to Opportunity program, which was a HUD program um, in the 90s that um, used housing vouchers to move um, a few thousand uh, low-income households into low-poverty neighborhoods and specifically into these low-poverty neighborhoods. And they, um, this was actually a randomized experiment. It was very rigorously evaluated. They had um, interviewers and, and surveys that were periodic amongst all of the, the participating households. And they did find that for some households, um, for some children especially, um, moving to this low poverty neighborhood, it, it, there were disruptions and it wasn't always smooth, but in the long term, there were gains, right? People kids who moved especially had higher incomes in the long term. They were more likely to stay in low poverty neighborhoods. Um, there were, you know, the, there are intergenerational gains that are possible for some people under a certain set of circumstances. And so I think that the challenge is that, you know, who are those people and what are the support structures that are provided to them to, to make that fit, right? To make, to create those potential positive gains from moving. Um, so, and I think that increasingly that's part of the dialogue is, is what can we gain from this, not just what are we losing? Um, the, the concern, um, and this comes back to some, one of the topics that Catherine mentioned earlier is I think there's been lots of thinking and lots of effort directed at this question of, of how to help people who are in very hazardous places already and how do we get them out? Um, the flip side of this question is how do we prevent more and more people from finding themselves in that position in the future? And that I think we have less of a handle on and there's been less movement on even, you know, thinking at local state and federal policy levels. Um, in North Carolina, there's been, you know, something on the order of 5,000 buyouts or so ever um, since about 1996. And um, we build about 4,000 new floodplain houses every year uh, over that same time period, right? And so <sighs> that I think is, um, <laughs> that's concerning, right? And that's hard. And, the, and I think getting a handle on, um, and we know what the, we know, right? There are very powerful developers property values drive so much of what the decisions are. But I think just in terms of like turning the tide on that front, um, there's definitely still uh, a lot of work to be done. Thanks, Miyuki. Good, good thoughts of, of places where there's work to be done, for sure. Mike, promising and concerning. Well, what I'd say that's most promising about the fire problem or the fire situation out in the West right now is this kind of um, nascent movement toward putting good fire back on the ground 
that's really rooted in um, empowering Native American tribes to giving them the power and the resources and the right to manage lands. And this is something that I became familiar with um, over the last couple of years. You know, I didn't know the first thing about cultural fire when I got drawn into this because of PG&E. Um, but I, I have found it to be the most hopeful and inspiring and um, exciting part of what's going on in the fire scene in the Western US right now. There are so many tribes that are finally getting resources and the power to, if not own land and manage it the way they see fit, at least manage it and, and, and be able to use it in a way that um, reflects the practices that occurred before uh, the Spanish and ultimately Americans came to California. And it's moving, it is inspiring, it connects racial justice to better environmental outcomes. Um, and I'm hopeful that we see more of it in California and, and in the West. I think it might be a really important part of how 30 by 30 is actualized in California. Um, so the hard stuff, I think relates very much to what Catherine and Muki just said, uh, and it, it's it's all about housing, right? It's about in Cal, you know, you may have heard that there's a housing crisis in California. I know at least two of the people on the panel have had to deal with it quite directly because they used to live um, in and around Stanford, and it distorts so many choices and it literally ruins lives, right? If you to to, to afford to live anywhere you know on a on a median income in the bay area implies with a family implies a mind numbing soul crushing commute and a lot of times it means a commute to the wooey right now and so on the one hand you know we're trying to stop it as the, uh, someone i work closely with senator bill dodd always says when you're in a hole the first thing to do is stop digging and he uses that metaphor to speak about building in the wildland urban interface with respect to wildfire. He represents Napa, a place that, and, and parts of Eastern Sonoma County, places that have been devastated by fire over the last several years. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of movement to try to limit development, um, new development in the wildland urban interface. And I think what we're encountering there is exactly the dynamic that was, Miyuki was just talking about that, you know, retreat or or maybe decisions not to put more housing in harm's way can only really happen in the political process if we decide to put housing somewhere else instead and so increasingly what we're seeing in california and, and actually i left right before i came to this panel i was on a meet in a meeting um that's a coalition of folks that are worried about wildfire and the people we call yimbies in California, yes, in my backyard, the people that want to make San Francisco taller so that more people can live in places that are safe and that also are close to mass transit and close to work. And I think the, the, the interesting thing about working on housing issues in California is that the whole situation is basically unsustainable and things that are unsustainable eventually change. They don't just keep going on. And we're really at that point. And I, I strongly suspect that part of the solution, you know, the way the solution is going to happen in California is we're going to allow, we're going to entitle um, a lot more new construction where people should live. We're going to put doorknobs in, in downtown, as Governor Brown used to say when he was mayor of Oakland. Um, and at the same time, we're going to say, no more master plan communities in um, severe high hazard wildfire zones like the Gwinnock proposal up in Lake County, which is a place of, you know, there are developers that want to build a golf course community in a place that's burned multiple times in the last several decades. And, and, and it's the kind of poster child for probably what shouldn't be happening moving forward. The challenge will be all of these older communities um, that were built long ago in places that had been logged and ranched 
and had relatively low fire risk and now have seen a century of fire suppression or maybe just 70 years of fire suppression and are in a fuels environment like we have now where you know the I mean, I don't know if you guys follow the weather, but it's going to be 110 degrees in Portland this weekend. That doesn't happen, right? That's that's climate change, and and it's and we're we're in the midst of a massive dry lightning strike in the same area where the heat wave is going to be right now. So there are these older places that you know are, are going to be really challenging to insure, um, to defend, and and there's an important public subsidy in fire defense that I think is really going to be called into question over time. We spent $4 billion of state money, plus probably $2 billion of federal money fighting wildfire in California last year. And homeowners get that for free. Um, but I think that's probably an unsustainable outcome, um, particularly if the growth rates and fire suppression costs continue at the pace they've been growing at. Um, so, but, but I guess the, the solutions involve creating places where people really want to live and making that affordable for people. Because what we have now is places where people don't really want to live because it's very far away from work and that are largely unaffordable and are dangerous on top of that. And everybody knows it. I mean, everybody, you know, the, the perceptions around fire risk have changed rapidly and massively in California. And so I think um, I think there's a there's a really it, it's it's going to be so hard um, because changing communities, changing the way communities look, is always challenging. But um, I think it, it's the hard thing. It's the thing we haven't done, but I think it's coming. I, I'm actually pretty optimistic about it. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. And Thomas. Well, thank you. I was just responding to Michael's comment there. Yes, we absolutely do need places that people really want to live. That is across the board. And I, I think that here in Florida, I guess, just to kind of pick up on some of the themes that have already come out from Catherine here in Florida. Yes, it is exciting to see some of the, the that it's becoming part of the common discussion here in Florida to talk about sea level rise. Um, but at the same time, I'm kind of hoping that, you know, since it's really in our blood for over a century to just live and breathe development here in Florida, can we at least harness that monster to create better new communities further inland that are in safer places? I, I, I hope that's one possibility. But I guess I was thinking that one of the most hopeful things for me to be thinking about is just what I have seen at this conference, and it reinforces what I think I've been seeing increasingly in the media in all these discussions, which is we really are starting to hear from a greater diversity of voices. We're hearing more stories. It's all becoming far more complicated. And you know, to pick up on that idea of messiness, we need that. That's so important because I think even it's changed me in the way I think about my work because I kind of early on had some of these simplistic notions about, well, as one of the panels was titled, why do people live here anyway? And, you know, just getting these stories and really learning can help us understand just how complicated it really is. And I think we need to deal with that complexity um, if we're going to make better decisions going forward. So I think it's very promising to see this greater diversity of voices and real um, much more talk about justice and equity and not just on the fringes anymore. And I also think that, you know, there are potentially some court cases out there that give me a little bit of hope, not many, but, you know, there are some court cases out there that I've seen that are a little less what we call law formalistic. Um, formalist interpretation of law kind of has this idea that if you look at the case law, all the judges do is extract these rules from the case law and mechanistically apply it to the facts of the case in front of them. But that stands in stark contrast to an idea called legal realism, which really talks about how lawyer uh, in the law that it should also the interpretation of case law also really focuses on the greater public good. And I've seen some cases that I would argue lean more towards that legal realism. Of course, this isn't always a positive because uh, as with any source of power, it can be used well or it can be used poorly. And legal realism argu arguably does 
you know, give more power to courts in a sense, but it does it more openly than formalism potentially, because formalism very often, I think this mechanist, this appeal to the me mechanistic application of law has very often been a product of kind of anachronistic laws that no longer work well. And now you just have to argue that, well, that's the rule, we're gonna apply it. Not that anybody's actually arguing that it's a good rule or that it has a good outcome, but it's just what the rules are. And that is simply a sign of something being out of touch. On the problematic side, you've all hit on it quite a bit. I think, you know, definitely with Miyuki's comment about we can't keep, we can't stop doing this. You know, we keep banging our head against a wall, even as we complain about a headache. It's just, it's a real problem. Um, but I think to go back to kind of my more legal oriented uh, topic, I really am concerned that there is not only this oversimplification of law, but I think that's actually a, a real product of a concerted effort by some to really kind of, I guess the word I always like to use is ossify or just kind of freeze. They feel like we've moved so far to giving more and more property rights to individuals at the expense of kind of the public consideration in how we manage the idea of property. And now it feels like it want, there are those that want to freeze it there and keep us from being able to bring in more of a consideration of public good. And I see that as really, really a big problem for us going forward. And I think, you know, if we're not using property to, as an institution that helps us generally as a society, I think that's a real, a real problem. Um, if we're, and I think that's uh, part of the problem that we're seeing with developers and we're all, we've all been talking about the inability to stop development in dangerous or hazardous places. And I think if you just look at what happened in Houston with the flooding there, it really is obvious the developers, when they developed many of those areas, they knew that they were in the flood or the, res the flood basin for the reservoirs. And that was made very clear to them when they purchased that property. And those, prop those developers, once they purchased it, actually got exemptions to not inform subsequent purchasers of those properties. These are the types of things that are just crazy and that we really need to address as kind of low hanging fruit within the law that are problematic. Thanks, Thomas, and, and thanks to all of you. Um, I've been monitoring our chat a little bit and I just wanna share some of the, the things that, that folks in our audience have shared. So on the promising front, I sort of see a, a common theme where people are heartened that there just is more focus on all of this, on addressing climate change. Um, and there's more investment, right? Um, and then also there's more human-centered approaches. Um, and some of you touched on that in, in your remarks too. Um, there was a note that anthropologists can help with this, right? We, we have some of the, the tools that we need to, to work on the people stuff, which is a good reminder. Um, and then also we see uh, some folks doing courageous things. Um, like actually implementing zoning codes that, that aren't super popular, right? So we see some of that. Um, and we just have more data and tools. So there are encouraging things. On the problematic side, um, it, it was interesting, you know, we saw some concern about just access to technology, uh, including the internet, right, is gonna be a barrier for some. Uh, designing for the wealthy is a problem. Um, and then not only, I think, you know, many of you touched on the fact that we continue to build in, in hazardous places. There are incentives to do that, right? Developers have, have good reason to do that. Uh, and local governments want that tax base, right? Um, so that those incentives are, are really problematic. Um, and then also there's a real challenge of getting to the level of coordination that we need to do this well. We need to just coordinating across the federal family is a huge challenge. But when you think about it, we really need to be coordinating across all levels of government. And that's just a really huge coordination challenge. Um, and then finally, a comment about, you know, we it would be good to develop in safer places. Um, but sometimes that is is opposed because it's seen as sprawl. Right. So some of these conflicting values are are things we have to grapple with. 
So I really appreciate the comments um, from our, our panelists and also from those of you in the chat. I think we want to move into to try and have a little bit of dialogue. Um, and Susie Moser had a question a while back about uh, sense of entitlement uh, being part of our, our definition of, of, of property. And Susie, I wondered if you wanted to um, come off of mute and, and say a little bit about that, that question um, before our panelists respond. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Wonderful um, panel. I guess it was it was a reaction to, I think, something that Thomas, you said, or I think it was you, um, who, you know, you were talking about sort of what we've gotten with this particular conception of um, property. And I guess it struck me, or my first gut reaction was simply that, yeah, we got a, a sense of entitlement. <laughs> now we have it and don't and anybody take it away from me. So I guess I'm really curious about how do we shift from that sense of entitlement to something that is far more people oriented and not thing oriented, property oriented. I mean, it's psychology, I guess, or maybe it takes political leadership. What does it take to, to make that shift? Wow, that's a hard question, Susie. Um, but it's a great one. I think it takes a lot of different aspects. It's definitely gonna take, I think, the psychological and the social change and the legal change are not separate from each other. So I think that really having that robust conversation is absolutely critical because I think that that sense of entitlement that you've identified is really a crucial, crucial problem. And it's part of what makes me so ambivalent about this idea of buyouts. And I think that, you know, as we're addressing complexity, we, we should be more complex in how we think about this idea of buyouts. Because if we look upon buyouts as kind of, if, if it's across the board, there are a lot of people that don't maybe don't deserve a buyout nearly as much as others. What about property owners who bought, you know, just this year, say on an eroding beach in South Carolina or Florida or whatever? By this point, if you are purchasing property along a beach and you're not aware of these things, should the public really be expending its funds as the insurer of your property? But maybe the question is very, very different when you talk about, say, tribal indigenous lands or a community that was established 100 years ago by escaped slaves. I mean, there are people that have been driven to these places. And I think that's part of what a lot of us have learned, or some of us like me have, have gotten a much better grip on during this conference. So I think, yes, that sense of entitlement also, it keeps property owners from the negotiating table because I think a lot of this, we need to work together and we need collaboration between different level, not only different levels of government, but between government and private property owners. But if I hold all the cards and I'm supposed to be made whole and given money no matter what, why do I want to bother working with you if you're telling me that part of the loss is going to be mine too? Because no one entity or person probably can or should bear all of that cost. Go for it, I wonder, okay, I actually just wanted to, to add on to the question and redirect it to Michael, because I think some of what Michael was saying about um, fire protection and the assumption um, that this is going to be part of what we get as, you know, California residents or people who live here, um, we're going to be able to insure a house for an affordable price. That's a very similar entitlement that we see from lots of of people who live and buy on in flood zones now. Um, and I wonder if you have seen that um, maybe some of that social contract is now a little bit more up for negotiation, especially as it relates to where housing, you know, how housing decisions are handled. Um, is it the case that if we get to some extreme uh, crisis situation that there are enough people to be those, to be the, the agents of change and say, we do actually need to change the power that has always been part of local government authority to decide you know, who gets to build and where and so forth. Well, I think I, those are well-posed questions, Miyuki. And, and I think this is becoming more of a conversation in California, like what level of provision of implicit and explicit subsidies are we willing to provide 
to people that make choices to live in hazardous places. Now, of course, this is all tied up with the housing issues that I mentioned before. But, you know, I, I'd almost say, you know, there's another dynamic that I think is really profound that's starting to at least be questioned in California, which relates kind of directly to this entitlement issue and, and sort of turns the idea of property ownership on its head. And that is that, um, you know, property ownership is on the one hand an entitlement, right? You have the right to exclude others and do what you want on your land, but it's also a responsibility in the sense that you can't do things on your land that create problems for people next door. And one of the things that's really starting to gain some traction, especially in Northern California, I think this is more entrenched in Southern California, actually, culturally, because fire has been a part of the landscape there for much longer, like really since this, since there were people in Southern California and chaparral environments, there's been lots of wildfire. Um, but there is an active conversation around what it means to maintain your land in a way that is safe, right? Historically, you've been able to own a piece of land if you can speculate with land, right, own it and maybe develop it in 20 or 30 years. And you don't have to do anything to that land. You can just leave it there. But increasingly that's becoming unacceptable because those patches of land that are just left there are in effect a nuisance for the community. And um, you know the, the way that people even maintain their backyards can be a nuisance to their neighbors because of wildfire risk, right? It interferes with their, the neighbor's reasonable enjoyment of their own land. And I think as owning land becomes or, or controlling land becomes more of a responsibility as opposed to an entitlement, that can fundamentally change like the economics of owning big pieces of land. And um, I think, in, in very positive ways with respect to these hazards. Now, I, I, you know, this is early days and I, you know, I'll have to see how far this goes, but, but, I, but I do think that there is starting to be some recognition that um, there's a lot of investment that we haven't been taking in land that we need to in order to create community safety and community health and resilience. And so, that's another way of getting at this issue, um, kind of, of like what, you know, what, what's the public role, like how much public resources have to be provided when you own a piece of land? And what do you have to bring to the equation if you're gonna make that, if you're gonna benefit from the other aspects of land ownership or property ownership? Um, I think, you know, it, it, this kind of thing, to, 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 to is, is very much in the world of, of what Thomas was suggesting about legal realism, where you know there's there's an interaction between what the law requires and what is politically acceptable and culturally acceptable. Um, and but but I see the the law of nuisance, which is kind of the one of the fundamental aspects of property ownership shifting. The ground is shifting in California in very interesting ways that make me hopeful about um, some aspects of the wildfire problem. And I had one other reaction to uh, Susie's provocative question and it's a little bit of a tangent, but it's really what comes to mind for me. So, you know, speaking of entitlement and the social contract as Muki drew it out, um, in a way it really kind of points to some deeper questions as to how we often in the space of science are thinking about people and, over the last few years, um, we've been part of a large and very intensive collaboration where we've been trying to say, you know, what does it mean to put people into climate models and people into impact models? So when we think about, you know, how we anticipate these risks and what's going to happen to people and the effectiveness of policies, you know, usually we're shoving in a, an RCP just saying, here's the trajectory of emissions that people shall follow. What does the climate do? You know, or if you're in the space of an impact model, um, people exist in terms of a global carbon tax. That's it. You know, or if you're looking at coastal modeling, they exist in terms of a decision to put in a seawall. I think what's been really fun is recognizing that like putting people into our understanding of all of these complex interactions 
involves individual and social psychology, right? So entitlement, yeah, to what degree is that social contract, you know, a norm, um, a function of our culture, um, a function of who's interacting with whom and what perceptions they have as to whether our status quo is effective. And I think what's I've taken from this collaboration is that, you know, when you really start to put people deeply into our understanding of how the world is unfolding in a changing climate, first of all, we recognize that, you know, failing to react to climate change, um, that supposed business as usual, whether or not you want to use that phrase, pretty much vaporizes, right? People will react. And I do think what we have seen in so many other domains of human activity, um, rights, civil rights, broadly defined is that the feedbacks between what people think and feel and how they interact and what's the norm and policy can be rapid, but often so hard to predict. And I think part of the complexity for all of us and really the challenge of this conference is, you know, what does it mean to make progress in any part of this picture when there's so many interacting features? Um, and I don't think there are any easy answers, but I think sometimes stepping back and recognizing that there are these social dynamics, individual dynamics, and when we take purchase on any one point, I think if there's hope there, it's the degree to which they are interacting and which that can lead to nonlinear change. Thanks to all of you. Um, as you said, a, a provocative question from Susie, thank you. Um, we have another question from Tom Fitzgerald. Tom, do you wanna unmute and, and ask your question to the panelists? Yeah, sure. Good day. Um, so coming to you from Wellington, New Zealand, um, but it was really just a, a query of uh, around sort of the public trust doctrine and how that has been used or could be used or what role it could play. There was, I know that it's sort of um, undertaken in different ways across different states in the US um, and various statutes and things. And it's also been sort of pulled into some legislation that I was involved in developing in New South Wales on under coastal management, um, but in a less explicit way. Uh, and in New Zealand at the moment, we're, we're starting to think about what a climate adaptation act for the entire country might look like. And I thought, well, I wonder if there's something in there about um, dealing with this private property rights issue. Uh, and, and I work at the coast, so it's particularly in, in those areas of, of changing coastlines and things. But yeah, just a, just a query about whether there were particularly useful examples that you were, were aware of or um, yeah, whether you even thought that was useful. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, Tom. I'm quite certain that um, our panelists will have something to say about this topic. I, I heard a talk earlier today about, about this in California. So I, I know Mike will have thoughts and, and others too. Who, who wants to start? I just went, so I shouldn't start. <laughs> I, I can take a stab at that, you know, so so California has been um, active in terms of application of the public trust in, in a number of um, contexts, most notably water um, and the Mono Lake decision and and then not just that decision, but the application of the public trust in water rights allocation generally. Um, by the State Water um, Resources Control Board in California. And obviously, you know, water is for fighting in California, right? This is a precious resource. And so the application of the trust doctrine and, you know, not necessarily trumping all other, I mean, actually it never does generally trump all other um, concerns, but, but the evaluation of um, trust resources in the context of resource allocation has become a norm um, in California. You know, and, and we have a, you know, with respect to sea level rise, we have a long history of treating the coast as special. Um, the California Coastal Commission in particular is an incredibly powerful institution in California and is way out front in terms of uh, moving on sea level rise and is ruffling a lot of feathers, um, both in the already developed communities like Newport Beach or um, you know, parts of Southern California or in places where people would like to build houses, like uh, where near where I live in a place called Stinson Beach, where the Coastal Commission is starting to say things like, we're just not gonna issue building permits because of sea level rise in certain areas of Stinson Beach, California. And um, the challenge I think is gonna be as the jurisdiction shifts, right? You know, so, so where it, where, wh which, which, um, 
where is the where is the coast? Where is the the uh, mean high tide? Um, which lands are subject to trust protection? And we have a pretty static legal regime with on with respect to those issues, at least so far. Um, even as we see places where, you know, partly due to just natural erosion, partly due to sea level rise, um, you know, we're seeing bluff retreat at you know pretty rapid rates, and so potentially the the jurisdiction uh, that might be subject to the the public trust and or the coastal commission is shifting landward, and in, and 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 um, I don't think there's. I mean, I'm not aware. Um, I'm saying, and I'll qualify that by saying I'm not necessarily a coastal commission or a public trust expert, uh, but I'm not aware of how that jurisdictional shift has been handled, if at all, and and whether there's thinking that's being done about how to handle it as it becomes a more pressing and widespread issue. Thank you do you want to jump in on California Coastal Commission? So I know we both have thought about that one a lot. You should go for it. Yeah, no, I, I think Michael, it just totally comes to mind. I think the, the presentation yesterday, the legal panel with the California Coastal Commission represented, just highlighting so many of the basics of, you know, they're a commission that for decades now um, has prioritized the concept of avoiding development in hazardous places. Um, easier said than done, especially when you've got one expert saying this is this cliff is good to hold for another four decades and then it collapses seven years later. Um, I think what Michael was pointing to now, you know, how do you go towards coastal plans that are you know, really adaptive through time that encompass the potential for retreat, uh, that encompass the fact that this is about salinization of groundwater in addition to cliff collapse, in addition to erosion, you know, I think it's being put to the test, but with um, a really unique infrastructure there. Um, and then what Mike alluded to is, you know, is it still public access to the beach when you're walking under a house on stilts? I think we're seeing a lot of these questions um, starting to come in sharp focus. Um, the other example that jumped to mind for me would be the, the classic example of the Netherlands. And if anyone Dutch uh, is on this call, feel free to jump in on the chat and we can um, give you a, a turn at the mic too. But just the concept of, you know, who bears the risk um, and is it something that, um, homeowners have a right to be protected by the government or insurance. You know, I do think there's a very different model that has emerged there over many decades um, with a much higher level of public provision in terms of safety. And I also think it's just a wonderful example of how norms have evolved through time. Um, my experience in submitting papers uh, for publication is that you should use a Dutch example. And if you get a Dutch reviewer, you'll get like a 10,000 word essay on everything you've gotten wrong. But the richness of that example is the degree to which, you know, a conception of safety after devastating floods led to a prioritization of safety and how that evolved into something that was about making sure actually that you can maintain fisheries um, and that you can maintain open access to uh, recreation areas. And I think it's just a wonderful example of a very high level of safety, but then coming into play in a slow, deliberate way, um, a recognition that that involves changes in norms through time as well. I'll also just plug quickly, I was in a session this morning on um, retreat and relocation in Northwest Europe. And there were presentations from the UK, Ireland, Germany, France and the Netherlands, and um, each of them did touch on the different legal contexts in which the decisions were being made. And it was really fascinating um, the way that in some countries, coastal protection has evolved as a right versus it hasn't, um, and what that means for the compensation framework and so forth. Um, so I definitely recommend that uh, as well. Thomas, did you wanna weigh in about public trust at all? Yeah, sure. Just briefly, it's, it's California is definitely out in front, uh, and that is wonderful to see. Uh, public trust doctrine in some places, in some states, has really been expanding as a tool for public access and protecting coastal resources. New Jersey comes to mind. And in Texas, it's got a very unique history that led to what was called the Texas Open Beaches Act. And there it's um, in large part because of their unique history and, and relation with Mexico. Um, but there it's interesting that the court had actually undermined it uh, about a decade ago. And here in Florida, the 
public, the access on private beaches is not via typically the public trust doctrine, but by customary use. And that has also been undermined by a court decision here in Florida, oh, over, well over a decade ago now, I believe, I believe 2005, which essentially said, yes, when beaches move, gradually the property owner will lose that beach if it moves landward or game beach if it moves seaward. But we're not so sure, said the court, that any public access that existed there moves with the dry sand beach on which it was located, which I think to most people would seem kind of absurd. So the property line moves and the dry sand beach moves and the water line moves, but not the public access on the dry sand beach. So it really left in question kind of that, what should we would have in some states is already protected by the public trust doctrine. It left in question the real long-term rights of public access to currently publicly used beaches here in the state of Florida. Thanks, Thomas. Um, we have a, an interesting question from Darlene in the chat that I wanna share. She said she better stay on mute, so I'll, I'll ask it for her, but um, the question is that, you know, it seems that a people focus really emphasizes a desire to protect special places, right, for their cultural and spiritual significance. But it won't be possible to save all those places. So is it enough to recognize and acknowledge those values? Um, how do we make decisions uh, when there are tough choices between protecting different places? So um, if you all could speak to that a little bit, that'd be great. Uh, so I recently um, did a reading binge on kind of what's the most innovative set of practices happening in the space of cultural heritage, um, especially um, in coastal locations subject to sea level rise. And I think it's a really powerful question and one that really kind of forces us to dig deep about what it means to maintain valued relationships with places that are changing. Um, there are a series of examples um, in the United States and in Europe, and I'm sure elsewhere uh, beyond what is easily dug up in the literature, where you know you can even say it's just kind of a spirit of citizen science of you know really creating documentation of the places that are under change. Um, in the U.S., to get that synced up with our best federal productions um, requires a lot of creativity, but we're seeing examples of kind of getting around some of the privacy laws. Um, some of the European examples are, you know, how to grapple with um, the need for privacy of some of those locations and, you know, you create a database of all the special places that's publicly available and suddenly they may be degraded special places or degraded formerly special places. Um, so even just kind of documenting what is valued um, is in many places a big part of it. And then I think what it means to carry that forward, um, there are a lot of interesting examples um, where what does it mean to, to move some things, um, recognizing that that may change the specialness of the place or the specialness um, of the structure, the object, whatever it is. But certainly we are seeing examples of moving lighthouses, um, moving uh, symbols of the representation of the importance of different places. I think we're seeing a lot of examples of documentation of places in ways that can persist, you know, whether that's photo voice or um, the video version of that, um, creating monuments um, in the plenary session two days ago, the, the wonderful example of um, the installation happening in Louisiana of Alaska villages and Louisiana um, under change, it would be a perfect example of that. I think it's something that requires um, in the space of science a lot more anthropology and archaeology as compared to any sort of you know, natural science. Um, I think in the space of practitioners, you know, it's really what does it mean to engage with people and history and you know, frankly different worldviews and different relationships with place. Um, but I do think that's kind of one of the most um, pressing challenges we have together and one where hopefully we'll see increasing examples of communities doing it well, such that even though the future will be inevitably different, um, that, that connection to the past is still there. Thanks, Catherine. Others wanna chime yeah, in, just, comments? Just one quick note to follow up on Catherine's discussion of the documentation. One interesting technology that's being used, I know in St. Augustine, Florida, and I believe up in Nantucket, They've actually been doing laser scanning of uh, actual streets and individual buildings in St. Augustine because 
a lot of these buildings just physically cannot be moved. They're built of historic coquina rock and they're hundreds of years old. And yet they do understand that at some point they will be lost. So they just are working to create this actual 3D model of these places that can be replicated if they choose, or at least presented in a 3D video format. I think there's, especially the past couple of days, there's been this very interesting um, dynamic of, you know, we can lose things even when we don't physically move and we can move things and not lose them, right? And I, like the lighthouses is an interesting example um, because they have been moved. They've been moved repeatedly. And I think it's, they don't stop, uh, you know, I was at a lighthouse on the North Carolina coast a few weeks ago and the same plaque that was at the lighthouse when it was however many hundreds of yards uh, farther out in the ocean was there, right? And I think the historical significance of, of, of it hasn't changed even though it has moved. There are other situations where, you know, people might stay put, but they're losing a lot due to the change around them. And I guess this is one of these places where to me, um, there is a lot of, uh, just em empower, like giving, giving people the flexibility to spend money the way that is aligned with their values, where these types of trade-offs become trade-offs that are uh, made by the people who care about the place, who understand what they are doing when they spend, you know, when they want to dedicate resources to protecting that place versus spending it on something else. Um, and I think, in some ways, I think recognizing the value and the fact that no other person is in a place to ascribe value to those things means that we have to, that, you know, we have to recognize that, that nobody else is in a position to make those choices um, and to make those trade-offs between, you know, what is, um, what is the thing that we're going to move and preserve versus what's the thing that um, we're going to memorialize in some other way. Um, and I think those are, uh, there are going to be many, many, many of those decisions that have to be made really quickly. Um, and I think just as Thomas and Catherine were saying, I think we are seeing new ways that people are coming up with to pay tribute and preserve cultural value, even in settings that are really hard to maintain physically. Can I just inject like a contrary point here that maybe, I don't know, this this maybe comes from you know, a long, long time ago, actually. I, I was a student of paleoceanography. I started work at Le Monde Arrier Observatory, not too far from where this conference would have been held if it were being held in person. Um, and we're in the midst of, we're just at the beginning of rapid geologic change, you know, that, that, that is similar to what happened to the experience of Native Americans 10,000, 15,000 years ago. You know, near, where I live, Native Americans lived out on the coastal plain, out to the Farallon Islands. They're now 30, 30 miles offshore of the Northern California coast. And they were forced to retreat as sea level rose. And, and I think one of the things that we need to be thinking about and starting to, to, to consciously articulate is that we occupy a moment in time in a process of continuous change because it's gonna make it easier for people. And we need to try not to concretize what the, the brief moment we're in now, the, the kind of recency bias that we all have. It is natural for people to have that bias. But I, I just think things are going to change at, at a significant scale that we haven't experienced in, in modern civilization, right? Not since the end of the last ice age or the end of the, the younger Dryas. And um, I, I just think it's, it's good to start framing our understanding of place and nature as this kind of moment of occupancy that in, 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 in enmeshed in a process of geologic and biological change. Thank 
Thanks, Mike, um, and everyone. We, we are down to just a few minutes. So I am gonna ask each of you um, to do a, a lightning round on one final question. And I'm gonna ask all of our attendees to, to answer this question in the chat as well. Um, and the question is, um, if, if you had a magic wand, um, what, what one change in governance law policy uh, would you make that you think would really need, move the needle on all of this, on shifting the focus to, to people? Um, so if you could, if you could change one policy, what, what would that be? Um, and I'll ask everyone to put their thoughts in the chat and, and everybody has about 30 seconds <laughs> to share their thoughts. Catherine. I think we need to shift deeply in so many different contexts from implicitly valuing um, billions of dollars of assets and instead saying um, number of people and metrics of well-being. And I think that applies locally, that applies federally, that applies globally. Well, that so. was um, very close to what I was going to answer, which was um, just eliminating the use of property values in any in any sort of quote unquote official governance process. I guess I guess I'll I'll go next and, and I have a somewhat smaller ball answer. I hope that's okay. But I, I think that in California, you know, the one step that we could take that would really start to shift the pro, you know, the gain, the the shift us in a positive direction would be to require that when municipalities build new office or commercial space, they have to build housing too. And they have to, there should be a metric, right? If you build 200 square feet of office, you gotta build two units of housing, something like that. Because what we have in California is a situation where San Francisco is building millions or tens of millions of square feet of office space. And the people that work there have to live in the Wuby. And, and we need to change that equation. Thanks, Mike. Thomas. And I guess I just saw the comments in the chat box about no more private property rights. And while there was a movement towards that in the United States, maybe a hundred years ago, I'm not sure it's feasible today, but I guess maybe if I had the magic wand, I would at least try to move away from a definition of what is private property based on the US Supreme Court's jurisprudence on the Fifth Amendment's protection of private properties and return more of the ability to define what property means back to a democratic level. Excellent. Um, well, thank you. Thank you to our panelists, really thought provoking um, ideas from all of you this evening. Um, and thank you as well to all of you who tuned in for this session um, and for sharing your ideas in the chat. Lots of, of good ideas there. So thank you for that. Um, and with that, we'll thank everyone um, and have a good night.